can we just kind of throw through the cookie thing? Because I am a little bummed that Famous Amos doesn't have any any like Fig Newton type of things. Because he was a fig. Because he was a sycamore fig tree. Yeah, farmer. but let's just be honest. Fig Newtons are nasty. I only liked them because you could break. They were advertisers. You could break them and put them back together. That's the only reason I got them. That is not a great advertising <laughs> strategy. <is it? laughs> Our cookies taste like trash, but you can take them apart and put them back together. We gotta so, try that. There you go. Welcome to the Binge the Bible Bonus Features Podcast. We're so glad that you're a part of this. We are in season four of Binge the Bible. It means we're in season four of the podcast as well. And just like the series, the podcast is designed to help you to engage and to get into God's Word because we understand and we say this often at our church that when we get into the Bible, the Bible gets in us and it helps us live the life that God intended for us to live. So that's what the series is about. That's what this podcast is about is to help you to understand and to engage with God's Word. Well, today on the podcast, we are honored to have Pastor Jeff with us, as it's always. Good to be so back. Good to have you. And Pastor Jason. What's up, everybody? Our Thanks resident, uh, we'll call you genius. I think that's I, the... It was nerd is, in the is, previous season. I'm being I, kind. I'm all for new labels and new seasons. That was I'll take that all day long. It's genius. probably not genius. accurate, but I appreciate it. We'll take it. And I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm actually filling in for our, our normal host, who is Caroline. She got canceled she, at the end of last season. It's sad. I know. It was sad. We're, we're praying for her, but... Uh, <laughs> No, she's, she's still with us. She's not canceled. Uh, but today, we're, we're going to have some fun. So today, we are talking about a really fun book of the Bible. So we're just going to throw it out. We're going to start it this way, that we're talking about a book of the Bible that has these things in common, all right? Okay. The most famous cookie ooh, in, the, in America, John Wick 4, one of Pastor Jason's ooh, favorites. All time. Southern Rock, still one of my good. favorites. Still good. And the Bible, one of all of our favorites, all right? So this book of the Bible is... The book Amos. of Amos. All right. So we also have, I, I would say that it's sponsored by Famous Amos Cookies. Come on. So you got to love some you gotta famous, love famous Amos. Amos Cookies. You can eat like a hundred of those. That's They're what we're so telling ourselves. Little. Like, that's right. a podcast challenge. Through the course of this podcast, we should eat a hundred. We need a cookie counter every time. Bag. So we'll definitely have cookie breaks. So if things get really intense, really deep, there will be some moments where we stop and take a, a famous Amos. We have Belgian <laughs> chocolate chip bite-sized cookies. For those of you who are listening, not watching, if you hear some some chewing, it's some Belgian chocolate famous Amos cookies. They're awesome. The calories don't count. So, fellas, enjoy. We'll We're going to jump right in. Overload. Right. And the, so we have famous cookies. Uh, we have a John Wick 4. How does that tie into this at all? I would say the Pit Viper. Just, I j actually just wanted to mention Pit Viper because it's really cool. There's no snakes in Amos. But just because... Uh, that's that, not true. There is, is one. That, yeah, there is one. Not true. We'll get there. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah, there is a snake yeah, right. in I Amos. Said it was it, it's, judgment, I think it's right? judgment, yeah, you know. Judgment. Judgment. Yeah. I like that. Breaking down. Covenant's broken. And then Southern Rock was because Amos was a prophet man. from the south. The southern kingdom, the south. So that's also why I'm yeah. hosting, right? Slightly so below southern, the Mason-Dixon line. Exactly. Southern right. gentleman. Yeah, I like it. So uh, whatever your fa your favorite southern rock band is, maybe we'll play that as some intro music or, or outro music, some Leonard Skinner or Allman Brothers. Turn or it up. Pick your poison. Does Creedence Clearwater, do they fall into that? I don't think they really count because weren't they from Milwaukee? Uh, you know a lot. Again, I don't know. I do, Mili yeah. Wake, as the Native Americans pronounce. <laughs> uh, I love it. Borderline about to get canceled. Yeah, now. That's all right. From Wayne, Wayne's and World, Alice Pastor, Cooper. Pastor Alice Jason Cooper said it's okay. Pastor Jason is canceled as well. So with that said, we're gonna we're gonna move forward, but we cannot go any further without this. And Pastor Jason, you're gonna help me celebrate this. All right. This oh, is yeah. a big week. Oh yeah. Cute, so cute. as of the recording cute. of this podcast. So whenever you're listening to this. Whenever it may be, as of the recording, there is a big birthday this week. Who it is, is later it? in the week, and it is our very own Pastor Jeff's birthday. Oh, let's yeah. go. Let's go. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So we would sing, but we're, instead we brought you cookies. So I appreciate have that. Have a cookie. You're also uh, trying to sabotage because we're in this weight loss <laughs> challenge right we now. Are. So this is very, very tempting. So as of the recording, we're what is in the serving size of famous Amos cookies anyway. Take it, take a, serving a guess. Serving size is a handful. Take a guess. How many cookies is a serving size? Uh, I'll go with four. Nailed it. Oh, is it four? Oh, wow. It's four. All right. Okay, see? so I can have three more. We can have three more. Yeah. So, but if you had one before the recording started, those don't count. Okay. So we're going to start count. fresh. So. Okay. Awesome. So, well, guys, we're glad you guys are here. 
It's exciting to be on. Welcome back. This is officially season four of Binge the Bible, the series. Mm -hmm. It's season four of Binge the Bible's bonus features podcast, and uh, we're we're off to the races. So we're going to jump right in with the prophet Amos. Amos. And so, famous Amos. So we're going to talk through uh, several things today, and let's jump in with, with a section we just call the big rocks. So kind of the main ideas from Sunday's message. So Pastor Jeff, we'll let you, we'll, we'll, we'll put the ball on the tee for you here. Take us through that. We'd love it. So <clears throat> big rocks wise, I think there's a few things we've got to understand. So we've already acknowledged Amos is a prophet in the Southern kingdom. And what's interesting is he doesn't have like a background of, of being a prophet. <clears throat> Instead, he's actually a shepherd. We learn that right out of the gate when you read Amos chapter one. And so he's not, it's not like he's drawing upon a lifetime of knowledge. He literally receives a word from the Lord. He lives about 12 miles south of the the border between the southern and and the northern kingdom. He's sent to a place called Bethel or Bethel, and that's where they would have had their center of worship. The king would have been in that region. And so just understand he doesn't live there. He's sent to prophesy to the people up north. And then the book breaks down in three major sections. I mentioned this on Sunday. There are three divisions or sections of Amos. You have chapters 1 and 2, which are the eight indictments to the surrounding nations, including Judah as well as Israel. Then you've got the second section, which is chapters 3 through 6. And this is the the warnings or the sermons that he delivers to the people. And then the final is uh, chapter 7 through 9, which are the, the visions, the five visions where we talked about the plumb line for a moment. So those are the major movements throughout the book. So those three. That's good. Good So yeah, that's a great highlight. And the message, if you haven't had a chance to watch that yet, maybe you weren't here or you weren't able to join us that Sunday, go back and watch that. Uh, It's a a strong message. I thought, Pastor Jeff, you you did a good job of like bringing, like this is not, these aren't feel good books of the Bible, right? (laughs) They're they're about judgment and, and those kind of things. But, but even to, with this one especially, we'll probably see it as we get into it, to see the parallel of kind of like the way that we live and where culture is. And, and you did a really good job of dancing through that without like... Um, I was like sashaying through it. It was more of a waltz. I thought it was kind of a merengue. Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid you guys know what those are. I have no idea. I honestly don't know what they are. I just know the words. So. I've watched Dirty Dancing. They were they all covered on that. So. But you did a good job of working through that. While with showing grace, while at the same time saying, "Hey, here's some, here's some truth." Yeah. Well, I think you quickly discover, and we'll talk about it a little bit here, that while this book was written around 760 BC, the issues that are being addressed might as well have said 2023. Like this is a lot of what we see in our in our world. So the accusations that are being put out there towards Israel, man, we're we're not far off. This is a warning, I, I believe, for us today. And it's a reminder that to, to get back to the things of God. And if not, there is punishment. There are consequences. We can only live for so long apart from obedience to God without experiencing the consequences. You reap what you sow. And what we see in this book is that the surrounding nations reap what they sow. Judah reaps what they sow. Israel reaps what they sow. Yeah. So there's a lot we can take away, even though this is, seems to be an obscure book, but it has a lot of applicable points for us today yeah and what I thought some of the coolest imagery you pointed out pastor was even even you pulled up the map and you kind of talked us through uh even those indictments when he's talking to Damascus to Giza uh to Tyre to Edom and and so on like you noticed like on the map you were pointing out how it was kind of all around the map and then all of a sudden he hit Israel in the middle it's like yeah he was like he was circling and then the hit the bullseye yeah which I'm just thinking so you have to remember that that Amos is or Amos, which is probably how they would have pronounced it, but we'll just stick with Amos because of the cookies. So he shows up to Israel, and if you're Israel, a prophet has shown up. You're like, oh man, he's got a word from the Lord, and his first seven indictments are about how everybody around you is just jacked up. Mm -hmm. So if you're Israel, you're like, it's about time somebody spoke up about this. Like, get them, God. And then he turns and literally three times as much accusations are aimed directly at Israel. So they were getting kind of puffed up, like it's about time somebody acknowledged that all these people around us are screwed up. 
Because it's so easy for us, even as a church, to be like, man, our world is so beat up and broken down, and the people have ignored God, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, and now here's my beef with you, church. Yeah. And that's what he's saying to these people of God. So it was, um, it was a slick way to lower the boom on Israel. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say something kind of quick. I thought this was neat because I, I love Israel. I've had the privilege of going multiple times. We actually have two trips coming up as a church, one in 2024, another one in 2025. And as I was studying this, I learned there's two rules of rainfall in, in the Holy Land. Now, the reason this is important is because when we start this book, it says, the Lord roars from Zion, this is verse 2 of chapter 1, and thunders from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds dry up, and the top of Carmel withers. And I learned that the two rules of rainfall are that north and west, if you look at Israel, north and west are wet, south and east are dry. They're very arid. So north and west, wet, south and east are dry. And then anything high in elevation is wet, low in elevation is dry. So the reason that's important to know is that Carmel is north and west, and it's also high in elevation. If anywhere should be dry, it's Carmel. But we see here that he says that the the, the pastures are drying up and the top of Carmel withers. Mm. It's withering because it's dry because the Lord is pronouncing judgment on it. So just kind of a neat little, like, I don't know, I, I nerded out when I learned that. I was like, oh, that's so good. Because when you go through Israel, you see these different regions. They feel different. Some are like barren and desert and some are really green. And I was like, I never thought about it like that. Mm. Northwest, wet, southeast, dry, high, wet, low, dry. Anyway, just a little bonus. Yeah. So, I mean, interesting. most yeah. of you guys know, I, I mean, I'm a nerd when it comes to this. I'm a context, context, context. So when you put up a map or start talking about the environment, I'm like, how does this match with what we're talking about? Uh, and to me, it goes in to the level of judgment. So Because so many people, Pastor, you mentioned it yesterday, how we're, we get so used to looking at God through the lens of our own understanding, and we forget to look at the God through the fact that, that he is ruler of all. He created it. He defines it. And so we lose the sense of that standard. And one of the reasons we see such a high level of judgment coming in, especially using a prophet who wasn't really a prophet originally coming into the land that's not his own, wasn't so much, he wasn't just pronouncing judgment on just sin. He was pronouncing judgment on the fact that they had broken their covenant. And so they were using a strong voice, an obscure voice. And it, and it it's also kind of goes to the fact, you, Pastor, you built the context around it that they were doing well. They were, in fact, all those surrounding areas were areas that Israel had conquered, basically. So they were offering up tribute to Israel, one of the reasons they were, uh, like, so endowed with wealth and riches and stuff. Uh, but also because everything was just working out. And so they're like, well, it must be us, so we can do it whatever we want. And, you know, you mentioned the fact they built two temples, one in Bethel, and I can't remember where the other one was. Uh, but they built two temples uh, to rival Solomon's. And so, so they're seeing, you know, these are ours. We built these. We're going to worship God how we want. We're going to worship other gods. It's, it's all us. None of it matters. We're going to erase the standard. And so they bring in somebody. And I, I, love, I love Amos uh, because, you know, uh, one of the questions that I was asked yesterday is, well, you know, he's, he is kind of obscure. Is the reason you did him first, you know, chronologically, he is the prophet that kind of set the standard for the other prophets that will come. And Pastor, you mentioned that this takes place around the Second Kings area. Um, and so he was the first prophet to come in. He's known as the first literary prophet. So he was the one that, before him, prophets hadn't really written down their own stuff. It had been recorded by others, um, prob may, probably uh, given to them by that particular prophet, but none of the prophets would have written their stuff down. He was the first one, they believed, to actually write everything down. Maybe it's because he got kicked out, maybe not, but he was the one that recorded it. And you see other prophets that come into the mix, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they, start, they, they stick with the trend. In fact, they all have little utterances and mention Amos. In fact, I want to say... Which is why he's so famous, by yeah, the way. He, he, he he's so famous. This section is sponsored by Famous Amos Cookies, if you didn't know. And, and it's a good segue. Uh, both of you guys are kind of going there anyway, but, but moving out of just kind of talking big picture with the message and getting into the nitty-gritty of, of the book and of the time, and I think that the conversation's good, so yeah. this is great. But yeah, sponsored by Famous Amos Cookies. Yep. Continue. One last thing while we're building context, too. So we acknowledge that he's a, he's a shepherd. We find out later in chapter 7, um, he gives a little bit of defense to who he is. Mm -hmm. And not to fast forward too quickly, but just for the context's sake, um, 
he's accused at one point of conspiracy, like your words, you're trying to stir up this conspiracy. And he fires back in verse 14, and he says, look, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. And I also took care of sycamore fig trees. So I'm a shepherd, I'm a fig farmer. He says, verse 15, but the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then hear the word of the Lord. And so he's basically, God interrupts his life and sends him on a mission. And he, we don't, I mean, he doesn't complain about it. He's not like, well, I don't come from, I don't have a background in that. I didn't go to school for that. He's just like, okay, let me go and deliver this word of basically uh, warning and judgment on your people. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I like that he's like, you know, you're accusing me of things, but you don't even know who I am. Yeah. This is why he's one of my, my favorites in, in the prophets because of the amount of courage. And plus he never asked for it. He wasn't, it wasn't expected of him. He never asked for it. And this is also another trend that we see in the prophets to come. They, they were, they would readily defend the fact that they were not full-time prophets. Yeah. This wasn't their job. Yeah. God speaks clearest and best oftentimes through people who don't think they're a somebody. And, uh, and that's definitely where he was at. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I, I feel like, you know, we always talk about how people feel called by God to do something. And I'm like, well, one of the best ways that I, I know that the Lord is calling me is I immediately have this sense of like, I am not qualified for this. Mm -hmm. Definitely how I felt going into ministry. Definitely how I felt starting the church. And while we don't see Amos saying that his background of not having a father who was a prophet He's a shepherd, a fig farmer, and God calls to him. I mean, I think about so many other people in Scripture. Moses, I think about Gideon, these guys. The, the, word, the call of God comes to them, and they're like, wrong guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and God's like, and that's why I want to use you. Well, it's encouraging, too, to, to the listeners out there who are you know, part of our church, or maybe they're just somewhere catching this, who are working a job like he was a, a shepherd, a, a farmer. They're working a job like that probably wouldn't make them famous like he was, but, um, but still God speaks to them. God calls them just like yes. cookie God break Amos famous. But you think about that, like there are people who oftentimes don't think that their life could be a platform, right. but God uses anything that we have in our life has potential to be a platform for his voice and for his good. Yeah. Well, let, let's go through this, uh, pastor Jeff, pastor Jason, like let's think through just, you framed the, the book of Amos up really well, pastor Jeff, there's the eight indictments, there's the, the six warning or the warnings and sermons, and then there's the vision. So like walking through those sections might be a healthy way to kind of go about this. Let's start with the indictments, like things in that section. I think that's the first two or three chapters of the book. What jumps off the page? What are some interesting uh, things that you guys ran into and found, whether it was in the sermon or beyond that? Absolutely. Well, if you get into the indictments, it, it can be a little bit repetitive as he's addressing these different areas and without going like straight through it. What we see is he starts with, with Damascus and he says this line over and over, for three sins of Damascus, even four, I will not relent. And then you'll see for three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent. And then he says the same thing for Tyre. And we acknowledge that what he's saying is that your, your sin has compounded and compounded and compounded and compounded, and now judgment's coming. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what he's saying. And so if you look at it in, in Damascus, some of this is a little bit tricky to understand because we don't use this kind of language, but he says that Damascus, he refers to Damascus as a female because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. And so I don't know 100% what sledges with iron teeth. I don't know, if Pastor Jason, if that's something that you've studied in on, but it sounds as if he's taken, they've taken advantage of Gilead. And because of this, I'm going to consume fire on the house of Hazael, the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I'll break down the gates of Damascus. I'll destroy the king who's in the valley of Avon. I mean, he just goes on and on and on. And we see that begin to repeat. Goes after uh, Gaza next, even for four, I will not relent because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom or Edom, and because of that, judgment is coming. And then goes to Tyre, and, and very similar, you sold whole communities of captives to Edom. Now, what's, what's interesting, so we originally, originally were going to cover Obadiah, and Obadiah is the judgment for Edom, for Edom. And so it's like we kind of see these getting connected together, and Edom's about to 
they're about to get it as well, but we didn't get to, I ran out of time on Sunday. I overestimated how much, how much ground I could cover. But then Ammon says, um, says that, that he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. Poor Gilead is getting just taken advantage of. Ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders. How awful. Moab burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king and then talks about I'll consume the fortresses of Kiriath. And so you see it just going and going. And then where it really takes a turn, though, is when it aims at Judah. I mean, these are, these are also these are God's people. These are Jewish people. And he says they've rejected the law, which it's, I just want to remind you, we talked about this a lot in previous episodes. We hear law and we immediately think of like the law, like, oh, you got the blue lights behind you. And we know there's a respect to, the, to our law enforcement officers, but that's not quite the, the right picture for us to have. For, for Jewish people, the law of God was life. God gave them the law when he rescued them from slavery. So as slave people, they had no law. They were told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and it was oppressive. When they became their own people, God gave them a law, and this law was to govern their lives. And so long as they lived by the law, there was freedom and prosperity. And so the law was not oppressive. It actually was, it was blessing. And so they've rejected the law. They've not kept God's decrees. They've been led astray by false gods, which, again, is like ignoring the very first commandment that God gives. And um, they, they have other gods ahead of him. And so now judgment is coming. And then the eighth and final indictment is aimed at Israel, and it just kind of goes on and on. I mean, it's the rest of the, the rest of chapter two, and he gets into things like taking advantage of the innocent, the the poor, um, you know, selling off the needy for a pair of sandals. It's like, what is the value of a life? It's been so devalued that for a pair of sandals, you could just you know sell off somebody trampling the heads of the poor. Amos is really a book about justice. If you really want to bring it down to, to it, it is a just God is saying you no longer are treating people justly. Mm-hmm. And we see this show up again and again. We see him talking about uh, sexual immorality. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. He talks about idolatry. And we just see him over and over bringing up how they're abusing and, you know, not just the law, but people. And we see a few other things, and, and then we'll I'll kind of let you guys jump in. But in verse 11, he says, I, I raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youth. Is this not true? You guys, you know this is true. And then verse 12, but you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Do you guys remember some of the requirements for Nazarites? Mm-hmm. Yep. So Nazarites were not to shave their heads. They were not to drink wine, and they were not to, anybody, touch anything dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So here they are forcing these Nazarites that have made a covenant, a vow to the Lord, to break their vows. And so he basically says, because of that, judgment's coming, and it doesn't matter, like, verse 13, I'll crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. Don't think you can outrun this. The strong will not muster their strength. The warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground. The horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day. I mean, he's like, it doesn't matter how tough you are. You cannot stand Mm -hmm. against the judgment of the Lord. And it's like, whew. Yeah, and it's crazy because not all of this imagery, some of this imagery, it, it, the, the words are spoken to be imagery, but some of these things are things they did literally. Like that, Pastor, you were asking about the iron teeth uh, and the sledges. That was something that was a, a farm, he's farming equipment they used to, to thresh and cut stalks uh, of their crops. And so God is saying that in some instances they would literally destroy their people with these things, but it was also image uh, of their brutality towards the people. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of led on to the, the murdered and pregnant women and burning bones and destroying people and destroying food. Uh, people can't eat without food. People can't live without food. Uh, but I also like the, the fact that they start to get into, not only is it are you supposed to act just and be good, but it should come from a transformed life. Because, you know, we see it when it, when it starts coming into chapter 3 and even in chapter 4, God's not super, super happy with their offerings either. He's not appreciating, he's not, he's not uh, 
I guess, taking their sacrifices as they're coming in. He's not honoring anything they're doing because they're not doing it from the right motivation, from the good place. Yeah. And something that's worth noting is what we're picking up in these first couple verses is the burden that Amos is bearing, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because, as I shared when we got started, his name, Amos, means burden bearer. And his burden is, is that you have... You are the people of God, and you are the standard, and you are to be the influencers. But instead of influencing the world, you're letting the world influence you. And I think that's a, that's a strong reminder to those of us that would call ourselves Christians that we are to be the influence, not influenced. Yeah. And I think of how much we've allowed the, the mentality and the mold of the world to become what we're squeezing ourselves into and... And it, it's, it, I mean, it's kind of scary as a, as a church and as believers to realize how much we are taking on the world. Like there's a, it's a little bit of a cheesy saying, you got to be in the world, not of the world. It's like a boat in the water. A boat in the water is good. Water in the boat is a problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what he's saying is you guys are taking on water. Yeah. It's interesting, the imagery he gives, and I think, Pastor Jason, you said this, but there's, there's this blend, and a lot of the prophets, a lot of the Old Testament, just in general, there's a blend of imagery and practicality, right? so they're always kind of interwoven, but when he's talking to Israel, he starts with, this is what's happened in your home, and then he expands out, he speaks to agriculture and how even you put so much stock in that, that's not going to hold you. He speaks to religious practices and the things that they put stock in there with the Nazarite vow that they broke, and that's not going to hold you. And then ends with what most of them felt like was their ultimate strength because it's ultimately what they were looking for a Messiah to come through yeah. was their army and deliver them that way. And it's just because of the rot that's happened on the inside, everything that they have put stock in and trust in and faith in he's essentially saying all of it's going to be gone nothing is strong enough to withstand what you've done and pastor jeff i think that goes to what you're saying like when we don't steward influence well the things that we put our confidence in we can't be confident in yeah and uh, and so it's just it's interesting to hear the way that he kind of just he couches that and and i like the way you, you you throw when they were looking for messiah because we see a lot of the a lot of the same imagery a lot of the same motivation even the same plan that amos walked out was similar to jesus when he first came in you know, he looked at the uh pharisees and called them a brood of vipers uh yeah. just to, to plug the john wick comment there, there <laughs> we can't say vipers uh but you know jesus went in whenever he stormed into uh the temple and overturned things we saw i mean that was part of god's nature as well because a lot of people look at the Old Testament and think, well, you know, God was a God of wrath and blah, blah, blah. And well, yeah, you know, we see Amos coming in and he's showing God is a God of judgment. But we see later on, too, that the full scope of who God is and why he is. And Pastor, I thought you, you did a great job leaning into that yesterday, too, of talking about why it was important to have these discussions. Because at the time, everything for them was good. And it's, he didn't go into a random spot. He went to the temple at Bethel to speak to them directly. Same mentality as Jesus, and I felt like it was the same godly, fatherly thing for him to do. Yeah, and I think what we're seeing here is even a pattern that you see throughout the Old Testament of the relationship between, or I should say relationship and response of the people of God and God. So like when times are, are, when times are tough, you find the people of God crying out to God. We, they're repenting, deliver us, God hears them, he responds he saves them, they, they begin to walk in obedience, and then because of that, they experience his blessing, and then as they experience his blessing, they turn their eyes on the blessing instead of the blessor, they turn their back on God, and they begin to ignore God, and then the world falls apart, and, and they have all kinds of issues because they're no longer walking in obedience to God, and it's like this cycle that keeps repeating itself, and we are seeing them at this place of depravity because they have been ignoring God. And say the same is true in our lives too. Yeah. You can you can run for for a while from the Lord, but there are consequences. That's how life happens, and it's not to like I said, it's not for God to pay you back; it's to win you back. You know how many people say, I, "Man, I was at my lowest point," and that's when that's when the Lord found me. Yeah, yeah. that's a gift right there. Right, doesn't feel like it in the moment, but it is. So that's where they're at. Well, that's a good transition point, Pastor Jeff. You you started with the indictments. We kind of walked through those. We've we've Got already transitioned a little bit into the warnings or the sermons that, that he gave. And that's kind of that middle section, those middle like 
uh, two or three chapters there, three through six. Let's talk about that for just a little bit more. Um, uh, unpack that. Pastor Jeff, as you were studying this, what were some things that, that just jumped out to you, maybe that you weren't even in, able to include in the message yesterday? So a couple things that I didn't get to add, because this is the bonus features. When you're looking at chapter three, we see it, it opens up saying, hear this word. And I told you that's how each of these sermons begins. And he says, hear this word, people of Israel. So we know that's his audience. And then he says something that's really pretty intimate. Verse two, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. So he's saying, you are my chosen people. You're, you're my, I mean, like I have set my heart and my affection on you. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. He's like, you're my special people, but that doesn't let you off the hook. And then he gets into these, what I would say are, are obvious questions, verses three through seven. I, I acknowledge verse three, do two people walk together unless they've agreed to do so? The answer is no. You have to be in agreement on the destination so you can walk together. Then he goes into a few more. Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it's caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? The answers are no. Does a trap spring up from the ground if it's not caught anything? No. When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? A trumpet was a warning sign. And so that would put fear in the people. If they hear that, it means they're being attacked. It says, when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? And what he's saying is the Lord, verse 7, does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants and his prophets. Amos is saying, God has revealed to me what he's going to do. It would be wise for you to listen up. And so he's proclaiming this to them. But verse, uh, if you go to verse 11, he says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, an enemy will overrun your land. This is literally a picture of what happens in 722 BC. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds, plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says, and this is graphic. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. What he's saying is Israel is about to be ripped to shreds. And what has been happening internally is about to happen externally. That's gruesome. Yeah, that's strong. So anyway, that's... How severe well, this it, is about to be. But you mentioned a few minutes ago, Pastor Jeff, like we will often say I was at my rock bottom, my lowest, when God rescued me. I think that is graphic, but it's the price of sin. Whether it was in the nation of Israel, whether it's in our lives, like that's what sin does. Not at first. It's been building mm -hmm. for a long time with the nation of Israel. It builds a long time with us. But when sin has its way, when, it, when its day comes, that's what that's what it looks like. It wrecks our lives. It ravages lives. You're right. Well, and he and I like the way he ends up uh, chapter three though. He decide like tells us. I, I feel like this is great information for us living now. But for them there, you know, they raised up the temple in Bethel to honor God in Israel, so they wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem since it was in the the southern kingdom. Uh, but whenever you're at that rock bottom place, you just got a clean house. And he says, on that day I will punish Israel for her sins. I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground, the same altar that they had used to honor God or had planned to honor God. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. Mm. Total cleaning house. Yeah, that's strong. Looking through uh, a chapter 4, 5, 6, uh, it kind of continues. I mean, he does make some transition into, he's saying, you've not returned to God. Repeatedly over little, and over. Yeah. He's like, I did this and you didn't return. Right. I did this and you didn't return. I did this. It, it, was, it was to get their attention to win them back. Mm -hmm. And I think that is pretty amazing when, you know, it's easy to read this and be like, how in the world could the Lord do this if he really loved his people? Because there's a belief out there that God is love, and because God is love, he just wouldn't, like a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell. A loving God wouldn't allow this mess to happen. And there's, there's so many layers to that that we don't have time for there. A loving God doesn't send anyone to hell. A loving God sent his son to be the sacrifice for sin so that we don't have to go to hell. We send ourselves because we reject that sacrifice in the grace of God. But a loving God also created a perfect world that was marred by sin. And because of sin, there is, there's, I guess, a cause and effect 
and there are consequences to our actions and what they're experiencing are the consequences. And God says, I'm going to use these consequences to win you back, but you keep ignoring me. And I mean, he literally goes through like I withheld rain from one town, but not another because I wanted to get their attention. You know, I struck your gardens and vineyards to get your attention, but you didn't return. You didn't return. You didn't return. And then that famous line in verse 12 of Amos 4 says, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. Mm. Well, I, chapter 5, the very first verse in chapter 5, when he's saying, hear this word, Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. When I think about the tension between the love of God versus the judgment that's happening, what stands in between is that word. It's this grief, it's sorrow. I mean, what he communicates with is, is laced with that, and the word of God to his people is laced with that. That it's not anything that, like God doesn't take uh, like pride or joy in punishing for sin. And again, it's to keep in mind how many hundreds of years are we talking about of turning their back on God, sometimes repeatedly, sometimes for long periods of time, but it is a lament that the heart of the Lord really comes through in those moments, that this fills both Amos and God with just sorrow. Yes, and if you keep going in chapter 5, we see where the Lord says, your city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. Mm. I mean, talk about re reducing the numbers. And then he says, um, he says, your town that marches out a hundred strong will only have 10 left. But don't miss this next part, because if you don't know this is here, you'll miss over the heart of God. He says, this is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. What were Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba known for? False gods and idolatry idol worship. What he's saying is, seek me and not them. Mm -hmm. You think life is in them and in the, these false gods. It's not. It's in me. And then he goes on again and says, seek the Lord and live. And so there's an option. You can, pursue, you, you can seek the Lord or you can seek these false gods. Seek the Lord and live. Seek these false gods and you will suffer the consequences that are coming. Looking ahead just a little bit, and, and if there's anything else you guys have, like chapter 6, like in that, that section, speak up. But I know, Pastor Jeff, you, you closed out the message yesterday, and you did it in a great way, but I, it was the most visually striking because you had, some, you had an example that kind of brought this. But in the, the latter couple of chapters, it talks about the visions that Amos has. And specifically, you use the plumb line which I think for a lot of people that was a takeaway. You actually have it right here? You? Yeah. There it is. There's the plumb line. Which is interesting watching. because I had a few people afterwards say, uh, so what is a plumb line? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, does it have to do with plumbing? And uh, no, it's... Oops. So so a plumb line, this is a pretty rudimentary instrument to simply identify, it's using gravity. So this is actually quite heavy. I can't say this is exactly what their plumb line was like, but basically it would be a rock or a weight held on a string. And because of gravity, this is always going to show you what is true. So if you're building a house or a structure of any type, you would have this hanging. Matter of fact, when they were pouring the foundation for my house and laying the brickwork, they would use a plumb line. So what's interesting is with all of the, the laser levels and things that we have nowadays, they still ran a plumb line at the corners to make sure that the corner blocks, the cornerstone, was level, that it was straight. And what he's challenging him is, you have been crooked. And so how do you know if something's crooked? Well, you put a plumb line against it. You'll never know what's out of true until you put something that is true, that is square. And so we live in a world that's like, I, I talked about this, you know, but this is my truth. And you can believe your truth, and if that's your truth, then your truth isn't my truth. And, and I get it, man. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We're a very tolerant culture. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to go, um, no, that's not true. Like, like, I don't care how much you believe two plus two is five. It just isn't. That dog won't hunt. Like, it's not. And I don't even say that to be, to be mean-spirited, but we have such an a. Like, like, everybody's entitled to an opinion. And here's the thing. Your opinion can be your opinion, but don't you dare expect me to function based upon your opinion and perception of the truth when I know better. 
And so what God's word is, is it is a plumb line that shows us what is true. And anything out of that is not going to stand. Yeah. So anyway, for those that maybe didn't understand what a plumb line was, no, that's good. hopefully and, that, that gives a little clarity. And it comes from verse 7 of chapter 7. Uh, Amos says, this is what the Lord, he, this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. And then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. He's showing them the, the true way. Yes. Because just like what you kind of alluded to, when opinion becomes truth, which for them, opinion, feelings, all these other things had become truth to them. And he had to like create a clear path. Yes. Because go back to, again, if you're building a structure and you show up and it looks a little out of true and you drop a plumb line and it's crooked, you have to tear it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, because of the crookedness, I will tear you down so that we can build it back true. Yeah. That's and great. it works in our day and age. It seems like everybody does have like an aversion to a set standard outside of their understanding, outside of what we feel. So I, I love the fact that we can take this into today and say, what, what is the standard? What is the foundation? What should my foundation and my cornerstone be built on? That's cool. good. Pastor Jeff, you mentioned uh, the basket of fruit. Uh, you talked, I don't know if you have anything uh, in addition. To Bottom line, that. it's ripe, meaning the time is ripe. It's, it's time. It's time. And then he moves on into chapter 9, and I'll let you guys kind of summarize chapter 9, but essentially it starts with, I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he, he begins to just talk about destruction. So I'll let you guys take it from there, and we'll close the book in terms of actually walking through it. So the thing that's interesting to me out of chapter 9 is, he saw, is I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, strike the tops of the pillars, and he starts going through what the destruction is going to look like. And, um, and then he says, uh, verse 2, though they dig down to the depths below, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb to the heavens above, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Mount Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from my eyes, like you get this, like they're hiding, they're running, they're hiding, they're hiding, like God is saying you can run, but you can't hide. There's no place that you can hide from me. And I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. It's, he's like, I, I said this in the message, but it bears repeating. God is just and he is merciful. Because he is just, he cannot ignore sin. If he ignores sin, he is no longer just. So God must punish them for their sin. Now, what's interesting is when we fast forward to the New Testament, we look at Jesus, and Jesus is a demonstration of the mercy of God. The, the punishment of sin is poured out on the Son of God. So he is still being just, but he's also being merciful. It's one of the most amazing dichotomies of justice and mercy. But here... The justice of God must, must exact punishment and discipline on these sins. Yeah, the most sobering words to me are in verse 4, and you just read them. I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. Those are just sobering words. We, I never want to be caught on the wrong side of that. I, I never want to hear that over my life. Yep. And to hear that is sobering. Yeah. It does get to the end of, of chapter 9, I think starting in verse 11, and it does provide a ray of hope. Yeah. Well, the, so the interesting thing with chapter 9 is it's, it's kind of widely believed now uh, that Amos did write chapters 1 through 8, uh, and when he would have written these is would have been after the, because we see in chapter, was it in the chapter 4 or 5 or 7, that he was um, basically asked to leave and probably ushered out of the northern kingdom. So they rejected him. They rejected his judgments. They rejected his, his word from the Lord. So it's believed that he would have written this well after the fact. It's also believed that he would have had help with chapter 9 just because the, the literary form changes slightly. Um, and so that was something that they wouldn't have wanted to leave out the fact of, of God's restoration and where we, start, we see in, in verse 11 with where God doesn't want to leave them. And I, I, I just 
I love the language here because it, uh, one of the articles that I had, I had pulled up and I had been reading through said, the Lord had a glorious future for his people beyond the impending judgment. The house of David would again rule over Israel, even extend its rule over many nations, and Israel would once more be secure in the promised land, feasting on wine and fruit. The God of Israel, the Lord of history, would not abandon his chosen people or plan of redemption. And I believe that this is a full circle of a picture of who God is. He is ultimately a, a God that loves. He's a God that makes a way, you know, in a wilderness. He's a God that's constantly repairing, constantly calling us back to him and will not leave us. Well, something else that's, that's neat, as we're get going in and kind of closing out the book, we, we see where Amos chapter 9 verse 11 says, in that day, and he goes on about, here's what I'm going to do, how I'm going to restore, repair, rebuild, and the days are coming when, and, and I'll get into that in just a moment, but something that's worth noting, if you were to take a, a quick trip back to chapter 5, it says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a way, of, it, it's, it's, if you don't know what it means, it means judgment day. Yeah. And he's saying, like, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, because he gets in and he starts talking about how it's going to be dark before it's light. Like it's, and if you think about the Hebrew day for just a moment, all right, so... In the Hebrew calendar, in the Hebrew day, it was evening and morning. The Hebrew day starts in, at sundown, and so the Hebrew day is dark before it's light. And we're going to see that the day of the Lord is judgment before restoration. And he goes through kind of what this judgment looks like, and we won't get into it because that encompasses a lot of the, the different visions that we see of the Lord, but I just thought it was worth noting that we're about, that the light is about to dawn, and we're going to see the restoration of God, but if we don't understand that it's going to be dark, and there's just a, a couple verses that uh, I think are worth mentioning. So if we're in chapter 5, he says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. Oof. Then he says, it will be as though, and this is just get this, this is the verse I had for you, Pastor Kevin. The, <laughs> it will be as though a man fled from a lion. Imagine you were running from a lion only to meet a bear. He's like, you thought you, you thought you dodged a bullet only to get mauled by a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake to bite him. There it is. There it is. <laughs> I mean, like you get in your home and you're Bad like, day. I'm saved only to, to get bit will not the day of the lord be darkness not light pitch dark without a ray of brightness and then he gets into i can't stand the hypocrisy of your your worship and your festivals because there's no you don't mean what you're saying you're just going through the motions you're complacent you're prideful all of this stuff here's the judgment that's going to happen and then verse 11 the sun will shine the day will break Night is over, darkness is over, judgment is over, and now you're going to see what I can do as I begin to restore. I'm going to restore, I'm going to repair the broken walls, restore the ruins, rebuild it as it used to be. Verse 13, the days are coming when, this is, get this picture, okay, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman. So the reapers are going through the field and they're harvesting the grain, but, but they are planting so quickly that the reapers are being overtaken by the plowmen. So it's like they are just churning out so much blessing and so much harvest. And then the planter by the one treading grapes, meaning I'm going to restore. And then he keeps going. He says, new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Mm. How cool. We see them go from judgment to settlement to fruitfulness. And so God says, I'm, I'm not going to forget my people, but there are consequences. Yeah. He's and a God of justice. He's a God of mercy. And he's a God of blessing. Yes. It's really strong. Well, that 
that brings to a close us walking through kind of the finer details, the nitty gritty, if you will, of, of this book. And so we're actually going to throw to uh, a sponsor, one of our sponsors, and because this is this doesn't just happen. It is actually sponsored by some things. One of those is Famous Amos Cookies today, so we're just claiming them. We have not, which, which I've not had a cookie break. So we're going to take, for us, we're going to take a cookie break. For all of our listeners and viewers, they're going to get to, like, take their own sponsorship break. So if you're listening to this, I don't know, go get a cookie. <laughs> enjoy. We're going to enjoy some cookies. And we'll be back uh, right on the other side of this break with uh, what we're calling the doggy bag section, which is essentially asking, like, what are you taking home from this message and from this book? So we'll see you in just a few. And now a quick break for today's unofficial sponsor, Connect. Connect is all about helping you grow in your relationship with God and connecting you to the community of faith here at LifePoint. Whether you're new to church or you've been a Christian for years, we can all take the next step in our faith. The best place to get started is Connect, a one-week event that will help you learn about LifePoint Church and how you can get involved. To register for Connect, visit lifepointnow.com slash connectclass. That's lifepointnow.com slash connectclass. Now, we'll get back to the episode. All right, podcast family, we are back. Uh, for all for all of you who are joining us right now, we're if we sound like we're still kind of chewing cookies and stuff. We kind of are I'm brushing so, uh, out my beard. Sorry. You got milk. Exactly, I right. need some milk. We need some milk. Yeah, those are good. So we'll probably continue to eat those because we're we're through like the the book itself, and we're now we're kind of moving into um, just the message and what we're taking away from it. So this section, go ahead, Pastor. Before Jason. we do that, can we just kind of throw through the cookie thing? Because I am a little bummed that famous Amos doesn't have. Any, any like Fig Newton type of things. Because he was a fig Because he was a sycamore fig tree farmer. Yeah, but let's just be honest. Fig Newtons are nasty. Did, did you guys eat them when you were kids? So, okay, I have a story. Okay. So my brother, if he's listening to this, I'm sorry to my brother. Uh, when we were kids, uh, his middle name is Newton. All right, so we were kids. We stayed at our grandmother's house all the time. You know, we were, when you grew up in the 80s, your parents just, you just go wherever yeah. you go. They had so to be anyway, reminded they had kids at the end of the day. Exactly, yeah. So we're staying with our grandmother. She, every Friday night, she watched Dallas. You remember the show Dallas? I was a JR fan. Yeah, yeah so she really watches Dallas. Well, she would tell us, with all the love that her grandmother would, would say, hey, my shows are on. Y'all shut my up. My shows. <laughs> That's exactly. I think, I think it was watch. actually her Y'all stories. Up, it was her stories, yeah. <laughs> and she would watch that and Falcon Crest. So I'm, I'm super old at this point. Yeah, so, but she would say, all right, y'all sit down and shut up. Like, my stories are on. So she gives my brother Fig Newton cookies. My brother had a, he would eat a lot of food back in the day, and he ate the entire thing. Gets to the end of the show, he walks up, goes out on the front porch, porch, <laughs> and like tosses his cookies everywhere. So we have called him Fig Newton for his entire life because of that. So anyway, so if my brother's listening, sorry, it was a great story. I wish I'd had a wow, cell phone back then. I could it. barely get through like three of them. I only liked them because you could break. They were advertisers. You could break them and put them back together. That's the only reason I got them. That is not a great advertising <laughs> strategy, is it? <laughs> Our cookies taste like trash, but you can take them apart and put them back together. We got to so, try that. There you go. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, we, we're going to continue to eat cookies, but we're talking about the doggy bag section. And this is asking the question uh, really simply, like, what are you taking home from the message? I'll go first on this. Uh, there were a couple of things. We've already alluded to it, Pastor Jeff, but you made the statement. The two statements kind of in parallel. One is that our uh, world is all about my truth, not God's truth. And that was, you had kind of a, a, a phrase there that I thought was really good. And it's true. That, that's kind of the way that we live. And then in parallel with it, um, you assim- essentially said that we oftentimes will align the word to our lifestyle rather than our, our lifestyle to God's word. And so I just thought those were powerful statements. They were things that, um, yeah, I definitely wrote down in my notes and, and it was a challenge to me. It was good. So I'll go. Um, two things came to my mind as I was just as we were running through this. The first was a, is Johnny Cash song that nice. goes, "You can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down." Yes, <laughs> not exactly the most upbeat, but it's um, when we look at this story, we see that the nation of Israel was running on away from God, and the consequences came. And I know it doesn't sound like a life giving message. But I think the Lord will let you run away. He will let you run on. He will let you ignore him. 
and there will be consequences. But I want to repeat the fact that th- those consequences are not his way of paying you back. It's to win you back. It's this, The thought that I have is the story of the prodigal son. His father let him go off, squandered his wealth, ruined his life, came to his senses, and came back to his father. And I guarantee he was much more devoted to his father when he came back than before he ever left. And so you can run on for a long time, but there are consequences. The second is um, when we read in Amos chapter 5, verse 24, that said, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The thought that I had when we read that was the, the speech that Dr. Martin Luther King gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And I just thought, how awesome that he's, he's calling on justice and righteousness. So if you think about it, justice is, is our actions, that we need to act justly. Micah tells us that. But then righteousness is our standing with God. And so I would say our standing with God should dictate our actions. And if we are followers of Jesus, our actions should back that up. And so that's kind of my takeaway is if... If Jesus is my Lord and Savior, it should be evident in the way that I treat people. And to be specific with Amos, the way that I, I handle injustice, yeah. the way I speak up for wrongs, the way I honor truth, the way I serve the least of these, that should be evident in the way that I live. So my, my takeaway is there. Yeah, so, and I can take off there because that was the, the big one for me. Uh, it was, was the fact of like living a, a life like out of a transformed life so that your, your fruits bear the same thing so that was really similar for me because when i told you guys when we before we turned the cameras on like ch- the title in my bible for chapter seven was locust fire in a plumb line and i said it sounds like a great weekend where i'm from <laughs> or maybe not a great weekend but a typical weekend it's a saturday night in the south right <laughs> uh but the reason that's such a big deal for me is because uh when i was in college like this was i was preparing i think i was preparing for a devotion or something like that um and i just came across the uh the, the part where he started talking about the plumb line. The only reason I knew what the plumb line was when you said it was because I had I had looked it up uh, before. Because when I read that, I was like, "What the heck is a plumb line?" Uh, but the fact that God would give us a standard to live by, like that we could live a, a life from a firm foundation, so that we can everything we do, like we're we're healthy, we're we're stable, we're in His hand. And so for me personally, that was that was one of the the huge takeaways professionally as a pastor. Uh, just looking at the life of Amos, because even later on in chapter 7, chapter 7 is my favorite chapter of, of the, this book, um, but where he's approached by um, Amaziah, or Amaziah, the, the priest of Bethel, and he had sent a, a message to King Jeroboam that this guy, is, you know, he's a conspiracy theorist, he's, coming, he's talking junk about you, um, and when he approached Amos, he told him to get out, uh, leave the land, go back to Judah, uh, and all that, and Amos answered him, that was when, Pastor, you said a while ago, I'm neither a prophet nor a priest, uh, but I was a shepherd. I also took care of a sycamores, sycamore fig trees, but the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy. And so there was a, a song back in the 90s that I used to listen to from the Newsboys called Lost the Plot. You remember that? It was from Take Me to Your Leader. That was the album. Maybe you need to sing part of it and I'll recognize Let's it. go. I oh thought Lord. you were going to go with a country song for sure when you said the '80s, but <laughs> lost the plot. Yeah, it was the last. Song. I know, I know it. It was the last song on the album. Take me to your leader. Great one. Yeah. If you guys want, look it up. I remember obscure things. Lose the plot. Was it lose rock? the plot? I thought it was lost the plot. Maybe it is lose the plot. I do. This was a great album. Yeah, and they kind of rock it out at the end. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Nice. All right. All right. So the lyrics for that were right there. the lyrics were what kind of hit me because so many people around him had lost the plot, and he became the one voice in a land that didn't want him there. And so that because of that song and that story with setting a standard, it just speaks to me as a pastor of having the courage to speak up. When nobody else will, you know, just like with being being that voice for uh, the downtrodden and other people, but also not being able to afraid to stand and speak up for your convictions that God's given you. So the lyrics to that song, let's be blunt, we're a little distracted, what do you want? Once we could follow, now we cannot. You would not fit our image, so we lost the plot. It's pretty good. It's a great song. Pretty good. Look These ones were awesome. They were awesome. 
little Christian Nirvana there. <laughs> it's pretty good. All right, guys. Well, we are we're on the home stretch. So this is one of the sometimes funny, sometimes whatever sections uh, of our podcast called uh, "Cringe the Bible." Uh, because there are oftentimes, especially in these Old Testament books, there's just some cringy moments. Personally, the snake one is mine, but I feel like there's... I was going to call yours because I just pictured you putting your hand on a wall. And a that's snake. a nightmare scenario, Jason. That's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> like, burn the house For down. those of you that don't know, Pastor Kevin, is it a phobia of snakes? Or is it... I feel like it's just healthy. A healthy fear? <laughs> I mean, it's the devil in Genesis was a snake. So anyway, I'm terrified of snakes. I can't joke about them. I can't watch them on TV. I I was in Friday night. I was out in the woods with a bunch of guys from Life Point, and the whole time I'm I'm just terrified. I, I'm yeah. I'm I'm not good. I actually started to say something to you. Decided not. I'm glad you did. I was like we I wanted to just stay. got in the car and gone home. So, but but I feel like this book of the of the Bible has sort of the cringe. There's like one verse that you can't get past. It is the cringiest of cringies. So I'll let you guys take that one. Well, so for me, I mentioned it already, but let's just go back to it. I even wrote cringe next to it in my Bible. It is chapter 2, verse 7, when it talks about how you trample the heads of the poor. That's pretty bad. But then it goes on and says, um, Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. That's just dis- yeah. it's not good. That's just disgusting. It's not good. Yeah. And so I will give a little bit. So I was looking in a commentary about what this means, and it says Amos saw the sexual immorality and perversion of his day, and how standards that were once accepted were then disregarded. And this probably speaks of father and son using the same ritual idolatrous prostitutes. So they would have these temple prostitutes. They go worship these false gods and these temple prostitutes. They would have they'd have sex with them. And because it also talks about they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. So just gets into this and it's just like that's how twisted people got. And again, I know that sounds awful, but we, we got a mess on our hands in our world today. Right, so yeah. there's a lot of sexual immorality that we would now accept as commonplace. And I think the Lord is like, what are you doing yeah. down there? Imagine if he sent Amos today. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, we have uh, we've done it. We did it. We've gotten through it. So the only things left, uh, normally in this moment, we would have uh, some inquiring minds. That's a section that we'll do. And, and so for all of our listeners, all of our viewers, uh, if you, uh, moving forward from the messages on Sunday, if you have... Uh, even looking ahead at Obadiah and Jonah and Hosea, like if you have um, questions about those, send those in. The The way to get to us is through our social media. Watch those. We'll send prompts on there, especially our, our stories on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we'll send some every now and then, some email addresses out where you can send some questions in that way. And we'll do our best to like field those questions here and just talk about it a little bit more. But So stay uh, tuned for that. Watch the socials. Watch all that stuff. And uh, we'll be back here next Sunday with part two of season four. And then we'll be back next week with uh, the podcast uh, part two of season four. So what we're going to do the rest of today is we're going to eat Famous Amos cookies. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So anyway, thanks for joining us. Yes, uh, thank we you guys. We will see you guys around the church. That's a wrap. <laughs>